Hey, good morning, guys. My name is Cody. I get to be one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you're here with us. Um, one quick thing before I uh, read the scripture and we jump into the book of James today. Um, back there on, in the back on one of the little tables, there's these little scripture um, journals. It's just the book of James, and then like across every page, it has like a place where you can write down. It's a good place to take notes, things like that. Um, if you're going to be with us through the whole series, great little um, helpful tool. But those are available back there at the back, and, and whoever's in charge of that, if I don't take this with me, you're welcome to get this one off of the pulpit, so afterwards. So um, there's like no electric fence that's going to stop you from getting on stage to get that or anything. All right. So, all right, let's go ahead and jump into the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Um, let's go ahead and read this. I'll pray, and then we'll get started. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, we, we read that, and um, Lord, I don't know about anybody else, but I read that, and, and I see, Lord, I, it's really hard to count trials as joys. Um, but yet, Lord, um, we know that you're, it, they have a purpose and you're working to help us produce steadfastness and you're working to make us perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And yet, Lord, when, when we read that, it, I mean, James is going to go on later on. He talks about like the word being a mirror and, it, and we, it, it shows us a reflection of ourselves. And Lord, I'm just being real honest. I look at this and, and I don't. I don't see a lot of those things that he's exhorting us to in that, um, in my own life. And yet, Lord, I know that I have a perfect older brother that um, is for me, is, um, is with me, that has not left me alone. And Lord, I pray that, that, would, that we would um, not be um, so um, overwhelmed by the exhortation that we lose sight of the affection that we have from Christ, our older brother. It's in your good, good name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you may have a seat. Um, a little bit of just introduction, by the way, of James and what's going on in this book. So the book of James, um, this is Jesus' little brother. All right, he's probably the oldest brother of, of the kids. So Jesus would have been born first. And then Mary and Joseph continue to have kids. And so this would have been Jesus' half-brother, full, you know, had, he shared the same blood as Mary. And what's interesting, though, is that he doesn't say that. He doesn't capitalize on this blood relation with Jesus when he introduces himself in the letter. He just says, James, a servant of God. Now, now when you think about that, like, well, wait a minute. If I was a half-brother of Jesus and I'm writing a letter, I would totally let people know that's what, Right? Like, wouldn't you be tempted to say, hey, I grew up with the guy? But that's not what he says at all. He just says, James, a servant of God. And then he goes on and he says, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he doesn't, he doesn't say, you know, servant of God and brother of Jesus. No, he says servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Like he calls him Lord. Like that, that is significant for us to grasp grasp onto. And yet, we're going to see that the idea of sonship is not completely foreign and lost because in verse 2, he says, count it all joy, brothers. Now, that's not an explicit reference to being a son, but it's implied. Like if, you're, if, if, if we're brothers and sisters in the family of God, then it's implied that Jesus is our older brother and that God is our father. You, you see it? And then out of that, and out of that context is where these exhortations are going to come. And they're more than just, these exhortations are commands. Okay, so I want you to understand, verse 2, when he says, count it all joy, brothers, that's not a suggestion, that's not advice. That's, he's commanding this church to do this. Like it, He's saying, when you go through various trials, and you're going to, and this church was, Count it joy. Not you should count it joy. It would be really nice if you count it joy. No, no, no. 
count it joy when you go through various trials. And, and then the, the natural question is, well, how? <laughs> because I've got to be honest with you. I don't always do that. I've been doing this Christian, Christian thing for a while. I don't have it all figured out yet. Uh, if you do, great, you come preach this sermon. But I don't. I'm, uh, that, that, counting it all joy is not always my initial reaction. And if it's not yours either, man, you're in the right place. Okay? So let's go ahead and just dive into this. Who is James? Who are these people? What does he want them to do? And how are we supposed to do it? Okay? I've already mentioned a little bit about James. Um, he's the brother of Jesus. He grew up in a big family. We think that Jesus, and, like Joseph and Mary, probably after Jesus, probably had about seven more kids. Um, uh, had, and he was the oldest of those kids. So he was the, he was the oldest of the normal kids. All right? Um, and, 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 he, and here's the thing. How would you, have you ever, do you have an older brother or an older sister that never did anything wrong? Or at least the parents thought that. But like Jesus, no, Jesus ne- literally never did anything wrong. I mean, how would it have been to grow up in a house like that with Jesus? Like, he started it. Pfft, come on, Jesus didn't start it. <laughs> like the parents would just would have known. No, he didn't start it. We know it's you. Right now, we and we also know from the gospel accounts that James was not a follower of Jesus while Jesus was on this earth doing his ministry. He came along with Mary at a couple of different times to try to get Jesus to stop doing the crazy things he was doing. Most likely, James became a follower of Jesus after Jesus' resurrection. Most likely, and we're not told explicitly this, it's not said in the scripture anywhere, but what I think happened when he said, I will go and meet you in Galilee, well, Galilee was closer to Nazareth, was kind of a hub, and I think Jesus appeared to his family. Wouldn't you have? I think that's probably why, and I think that, I think that James became a believer, he, and, which is why he calls him the Lord Jesus Christ. That's... He's no longer just my older brother. He is that, but he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And my first primary relationship with him is I'm a servant of his. I'm not trying to capitalize or leverage this blood relation that I have with Jesus. No, I've yielded my knee in faith and trust and obedience to him just like everyone else has. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Blood relation to Jesus doesn't doesn't matter. Otherwise, Dan Brown's book, Really does ha- really is true, but that's not no that's anyway that wasn't in my notes. I'm going to stop and we're going to move on. All right, all right. So who are these people? Who are these people? That's who James is. He's a brother of Jesus. He's he's now a Christian. We know that James is probably the leader of the church at Jerusalem, which gets us into this next section where he says to the twelve tribes of the dispersion. This is a very very Jewish book. This book was written to primarily background Jew, Jewish background believers, people who were raised in Judaism, who became followers of Jesus, just like most of the people in the early church in Jerusalem. And they have now, because of the persecution that has erupted within Jerusalem, we're told in the book of Acts that a lot of those people were dispersed. And we also know that this word dispersion, that's a common thing for the Jewish people they're they're used to being they're used to that because they were dispersed after the Babylonian captivity and all over the place so they're using old testament hebrew language and now a new testament christian context that these jewish background believers would have been familiar with they were dispersed as jews they came together they believed in jesus now they're dispersed from jerusalem all across um, Palestine, all across the, the, the Palestinian world and Asia Minor because of persecution, because of their fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why he says to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The 12 tribes, he's, that's, that's Christian language that he's incorporating from Hebrew saying, hey, you're, you're still God's people. I know, that, I know that the people who are still Jewish and don't receive Jesus, they don't believe in Jesus, They don't consider you the people of God anymore. I'm telling you, you are still the people of God. That followers of Jesus are the people of God. 
I know that you're countrymen. I know that you've lost jobs. I know that you've lost, you don't get invited to, you know, the Passover anymore. You don't get invited to family reunions. You don't get to go and do all these other things. A lot of your family have written you off because of your faith in Jesus. You've lost jobs. You've lost status. You've lost your homes because of the persecution that has happened. Like You have lost a lot of things. And I'm telling you, you're still part of the family of God. You're still part of the 12 tribes. You see what he's saying? Listen, belonging matters. Community matters. It's not an optional thing. And we see it all in this language that he says. Yes, there is service. Yes, that is, we are servants of God. But 12 tribes, you still belong. Count it all joy, brothers. It's, it's community. It's rooted in compassion. It's rooted in identity, but it, it still matters. And here's why. Here, I, I know I'm hammering this point a lot. If you primarily see yourself as a servant, if that is your primary identity, and if it's not rooted in family, if it's not rooted in the adoption of God, that He has adopted you and brought you into His family, you can only go so long seeing yourself as a tool and not a son or a daughter. Now that's a, I'm telling you that and that's, that's coming from a place that I've been, we've been grinding at this now for five years, planting a church. I've been pastoring now for, since 1998 and there's a lot of things. So I'm just being open and honest and vulnerable with you. Guys, this is, this book that I'm preaching through, I'm, I am needing this, okay? This is not coming from a place that, that from a guy who's got it all figured out. Like, I know in my head, I know in my head that I'm a son of God. I know that God has adopted me. I understand the doctrine of justification. I understand the doctrine of election, that he chose me before the foundation of the world. I, I know all of that theology. And I'm telling you, it is possible to know a lot of theology. And it is possible to get real practical and get busy and do a lot of things in the church. And you get so busy that you lose your identity as a son or a daughter of God. I'm telling you that is possible. And you have to fight for it. And you have to go back into the basics. God is primarily more interested in how he relates to you than what you do for him. He's, he's, he's more interested in you as a person than what you can do for him. God does not need to use you. He can get someone else. Now what's weird in that is what we can think through like, well, yeah, he doesn't need me. So he just, you know, he just uses everybody. You see how quickly you can go into this accusatory nature and that even creates more distance with God. And that's not who he is. Okay? So James, a servant of God. Now, I want to stop. Um, and, and I want to, because this, the word servant here, it means slave. Okay? The context for this goes back into the book of Exodus chapter 21. And there, God is giving rules for his people. And I understand that whenever, as soon as you say slave... In our context, we start. We, we we have a very specific American lens that we're looking at that through. Okay, I am not trying to say that. I, I realize I'm I'm walking on eggshells here. Okay, Thank, thankfully we're a small church, <laughs> right? You know, so let's let's just go ahead and, and lay this out. There was something in the Old Testament where a person could choose to become a slave, and God made laws for it. And it's found in Exodus chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. We're not going to read all of it. You can go back and look at it. But basically the context was, if a person becomes a slave, he can only, a, a, a fellow Hebrew, he can only be a slave for six years. In the seventh year, he, he's set free. However, at the, end of that, at the end of that six years, if he says, I have it better in my, I love my master. I have it better here than what I could have ever been able to do on my own. 
I just want to stay in his home. Then you can, you, you can go and tell the master, I, I, I want to stay here. And they would have this ceremony that you would go to the doorpost and he would take an awl and a hammer and you basically pierce his ear. Like, and I know that you're thinking, wait, like with a needle? No, with like a tool out from the work shed and a hammer, like, it, like, a, like, a, like a gauge in his ear. And it would put a signet ring and say, saying that he belongs. And then that would be a, a visual clue to whoever that like, I'm, I'm owned. I, and I'm, I'm gratefully owned. I'm, I'm, I'm gladly owned. Uh, I gladly call him my master. He, I love him. That's the ceremony. Now, what's difficult in, in going back and reading that is that there was other stipulations. And I'll just be honest with you. As I'm reading the word, sometimes you read things in Scripture that you don't naturally understand and you wrestle with. And this is one of those passages that I did. I really struggle with whether or not to even bring this up today because I'm sitting there thinking, do I really want to put that out in the water? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to put it out there. I'm just going to, I just want you to know that I wrestle with some things I, I read in Scripture too. But at the end of the day, it's God's Word and not my opinion that rules. That's part of being a servant of God. It's, it's God's Word. Is His Word authoritative? Here's where my struggle was. As you go back and you read Exodus 21, verses 1 through 6, I understand I have it better with my master. I want to become him. Here's these little caveats in there, though. It says, if he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, he shall go out married. But if his master shall give him a wife, and they shall have kids, and at the end of that time, he decides he wants his freedom and he goes out. He doesn't take his wife or his kids with him. You see the rub? Do you see it? Like, I read that and I'm like, well, wait a minute, hold on. That doesn't like, God, you're, you're, you're talking about like tearing up families? Like, do you see? How, like, God, why would you do that? And yet at the same time, it stands. It, 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 there's no way of getting around it. It's, it. That's what he said. That's what the word says. And I had to come back to it like, oh, maybe, maybe God knew more than I know. You think that's true? <laughs> do you think God knows more than you do? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. He does. Maybe, maybe God says, I think I want that wife and those kids to be okay. And this guy don't have a great track record. Otherwise, maybe he shouldn't have been in this place. I, you know, maybe God says, I'm going to make sure that these people that, that can't provide for themselves, I'm going to make sure they're taken care of. You think, it, I'm just going to talk to the guys for just a second. You think it's possible that God loves your wife and kids more than you? I guarantee you he does. I promise you he does. Now I realize that's sobering. Because, but here's the thing. We're not the Savior. Husbands, you're not the Savior. You're a servant. You're a servant of God. Only God is the Savior. I was doing marital counseling one time, and I had this, um, this family was going through it, and um, what, what, young, young married couple, um, and I asked him the question, I, I, you know, he, he was not where she, she thought he should be as the leader, and, and that, that's a common thing, and he probably wasn't, and but I, but man, she was. It was, it was a hard thing. And I asked one time. I said, I said, where do you see? You know, like if 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 you're here and and God's here, where do you see? You know, if He's here and you're you're here, where do you? Or you're here and God's here. Where do you see yourself? And she said, Oh, right here. I'm like, so you see yourself as between Him and the Lord? And she said, Yeah. And I just opened up Hebrews and I said. And I just read scripture. I said, there's one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Jesus Christ. I said, it's not you. You're not the mediator. Oh, and she got mad. <laughs> and then she cried. 
And then she hugged me. <laughs> and she said, thank you for getting that off of my shoulders. Because <laughs> like, it was a relief. Like, you're, we're not the mediator between our spouses. Jesus Christ, he's the one mediator that we have. And so we, we're not the Savior. We, we don't die for our spouses. We don't die for our brothers and sisters. We're not that. There is a sense that we are just servants. But that servanthood is rooted in this deep, intimate fellowship with God whereby we get to call ourselves brothers and sisters, that Christ is our older brother. And I'm sure James had a unique perspective on that. But he didn't leverage that. But there is true that we have been adopted into the family of God and God doesn't just treat us like masters. He treats us as sons and daughters because his nature is he's fatherly. And so that's the question. It, that, this, gets, this is the background for how we do this hard thing that he's telling us to do. These people, they, were, they had lost family. They had been kicked out of their homes. They had lost jobs. They're going through it. They're experiencing various kinds of trials. And their trials that they're experiencing are specifically related to the fact that they've identified Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, I realize that that's a different context that we have. Probably most of the trials that you see as trials, I'm just guessing that your trials are not specifically related because you have allegiance to Jesus Christ. You haven't lost your house because you believe in Jesus. Your family may or may, most likely, statistically, has not necessarily disowned you because you have sworn allegiance to Jesus Christ. You may not have lost your job because of that. Nevertheless, there are still trials that we go through, which I think is why James says various kinds of trials. Okay? So I'm not saying that your trial doesn't matter, but... Let's not lose the context here. These are people who, they've, they've lost a lot because of their allegiance to Jesus. Okay? So how do you count it joy? Because that's what he says to do. He says, count it all joy. Wouldn't it be better if James would have said, count some of it joy? <laughs> Wouldn't that have been like, great, great. All right, I don't have to count this one as joy. I get like a reprieve. Like I get like a mulligan on this one. Okay, I don't have, No, he didn't give us that. It, count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when, when you meet ver- trials of various kinds. So these people are going through it. You may be going through it as well. This, this is a strange exhortation. I get that. If you're going through it and, you know, you, and you also expect James like, James, you're really going to start the letter like that? Don't you want to ease into this thing a little bit? Nope. James just, boom, count it all joy. String or exhortation. In fact, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. The word um, count it, it, it means consider it, deem it, reckon it. That's the one I like. Reckon it, which comes from reconcile. Like, that's how, like, consider it, count, count it. It's almost like a, a financial term, like adding things up. And then he says, brothers, family language, not workplace. Brothers, not coworkers. The implication is that being part of the family God is belonging. It's not earning. It's being, not doing. It's identifying as a son or daughter of God more than a tool of God. You're a son, not just a shovel. You're a servant, yes, but also a brother, which implies that you are a son or a daughter. He is a father, not just master. He is master, but his, his, his fatherliness undergirds that. So when you meet these trials of various kinds, and the assumption is you will meet trials. You're just going to. We live in a broken world. We, I mean, your, your kids are not going to be perfect, regardless of what you think. I mean, I love it, you know, like, <laughs> like, this is the cynical part of me having a kid that's like, you know, 22 and 20 and 14. I got reminded of this this morning. I don't go into all the details, but we had a little blow up, duck up this morning. Not, things don't always go well on Sunday mornings in the Deaver's household. Shocker. All right. Um, 
Like, when you have this little kid, and we got a lot of them, and I get the sentiment, and they say, oh, they're just perfect. And the cynical part of me is like, just wait. <laughs> you know, like, it's, you know that it's not going to always stay that way, right? Because you're, you're, I mean, you're living in this household with this little sinner that is incredibly selfish, that gives no thought to your wants or your needs, <laughs> Right? Some of you are like, how dare you speak about my child that way? Well, you will. <laughs> you, you will sometime too. <laughs> All right? When you meet various kinds of trials, the assumption is you're going to meet them. If, if, you're, if you're going to marry someone, you're marrying a sinner, you're going to have conflict. If you're going to have kids, that's going to be conflict. If you're going to work in a place with other people, there's going to be conflict. If you're going to have, if you're going to have a community group, if you're going to get in relationship and really be vulnerable with other people, there's going to be con- like it's you're going to encounter trials. If you're going to be in relationship with someone, you're going to encounter trials. If you say, "Well, that sounds too costly. I don't want to be in relationship. I'm an introvert. I don't want it." Like that's for extroverted people. Well, that's that. Okay, I get that. And you're not, you don't have to be in, in as much relationship with people. There's not like a standard you have to meet. But also. You're, if you just say, I'm never going to be in relation with anyone, well, now you're fighting against the Imago Day in which you were created. You were created for community, and you can't live that way. You can't be in constant loneliness. There's, just, there's going to be various trials. These folks, they had lost jobs, they had lost means, they had lost family. They were starting over in new towns. They didn't fit in, the local, they didn't fit in, in the local synagogue anymore. They believed Jesus was the Messiah, and that belief ostracized them from their Jewish countrymen. It just took them out of their normal way of life and their normal rhythms. And in addition to the specific trials associated with being a follower of Jesus in a hostile environment, not only were the Jews against them, but also the Romans. Because Christianity is considered religio illicita, illicit religion. It's not something that was already baked in. This is a new thing, and the Romans didn't like new religion. Because they thought of new religions as the seedbed for revolution. And the main thing in Roman was to keep the peace. The Pax Romana. Peace of Rome. So he says, consider it, count it all joy when you encounter these different trials. How? Verses 3 and 4. It it comes down to what you know. It comes down to what you know and believe. And this is why I'm going to link this back to something that's foundational for the servant of, of God, going back to a son or a daughter. It, because it, you can't know it if a shovel doesn't know anything. A son or a daughter does. Or at least they should. A, a shovel doesn't know anything. You're not just a tool. You're not just a tool. You're not an inanimate object. You're a person that God wants to have a relationship with. The thing is, is that we, so, we, we can forget that. You have to know what the trial is for. It's supposed to produce steadfastness. I was scrolling through Facebook the other day. I, I know, I, I do that. You do too. Don't judge me. Um, and I ran across this meme. I didn't even research it. So it may not be true. I don't know. It's on Facebook, so it's got to be true, right? Um, but there was, this, there was this runner, and it showed this runner. And he, I don't know if he's from Kenya or where. He's probably from Kenya because, I mean, those guys can run. I mean, that, but he definitely didn't look like me, all right? And it said he just finished this marathon. And this is what it said. It said the last mile of this marathon, he ran like in four minutes 30 seconds. It was crazy. It was just, like I said, I don't know if it's true or not, but the thought occurred to me, I'm like, even if that's not true, and even if he ran the last mile in six minutes, which clearly I'm not well versed on minutes for mile. I don't know what the norm is or what the records are. But, but I read that and I, I'm, like, I'm like, even if he runs the first mile in that kind of time that's remarkable i bet he's been training for this for a while like you don't 
you don't get up one day and just decide you're going to go run the Boston Marathon and place in the top 100. No, you have to work up to it. That takes time. You have to produce steadfastness. You have to get to the point where you're training in running where you hit a wall and you push through. You have to... It, you have to produce steadfastness. The reason that this runner, whether or not he could run, run it in four minutes at the last, I don't know. But the reason he could run it at that last mile at an accelerated pace was because he had pushed through. He had become steadfast in mile three, in mile four, in mile 10, in mile 15. He had, that's, that's what he had done. So you have to know what the trial is for. It's the trial is supposed to produce steadfastness in you. That's what it's designed to do. The problem that we have so many times, especially if we relate, instead of as a son, but as a tool, if, we were, if, if, we, if our primary identity is as a tool, just used of God, indiscriminately expendable, then we, we will not say that the trial is for us, but it's against us. And once you see that the trial is against you and not for you, it's just a very, very small step for you to think that God is not for you, but is instead against you. You see it? I realize I'm meddling. I get it. Um, but if you don't believe the trial is ultimately for your good, or, and that God is using it to produce something in you, you will eventually get very discouraged. And some of you will get discouraged faster than others. It's the danger of believing that God doesn't care about you or believing that God is actually against you. But when you know that the trial is designed to produce steadfastness, then you know that God is using this thing to make you perfect, to make you complete, lacking in nothing. And we, we can go back and we can look at the life of Jesus. Like, Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. But did Jesus encounter trials? Well, yeah. Did he encounter various kinds of trials? Yeah. He, I mean, his family didn't get him. He was rejected by them. He was rejected by the religious establishment. He was rejected and betrayed even by some of his own disciples. Abandoned. We talked about that the last few weeks. He did go through those various kinds of trials. We, and, and the servant's not above the master. We're, we're not going to, you know, we're, we're not immune to that. I want to wrap it up kind of with the illustration. We've talked about kids. Um, and we've, we, we kind of, we have a lot of um, kids in, in our um, uh, church. Um, the nursery is blowing up. I mean, you people keep having babies. It's awesome. And also, we need people to serve in nursery and toddlers because and, there's, there's a lot of little hands and legs that are running around in there, and, you know. Um, and if you want to do that, see Megan. She's here. Raise your hand, Megan. Oh, just joking. Megan. Yeah, yeah, all right. So. <laughs> Megan's our kids' leader. Um, just, yeah, yeah, whoop, whoop. Um, but, but when a kid learns to walk, right, I mean, how many of you remember your, your child's first steps? I'm assuming you were there. Two of you, great, all right. So you weren't there, all right, no. Just, um, we, we were there for our kids' first steps. Um, we got to be there for some of our friends' um, first steps, um, their, their kids. Um, and, and, and it's kind of like there's excitement and fear kind of all at the same time, right? Because you're like, okay, move the coffee tables, put the cushions down, like they're, like, they're not going to make it. <laughs> they're going to fall. You, you know that. Like, no kid takes his first step and starts running that marathon in four minutes and 36 seconds. Like, no, that, that ain't what they do. They, they, they walk around drunk for a while, right? If they get one or two steps, we're elated. The focus is on the steps they made, not on the fall that they took. Because their legs are shaky and they're unstable and they're untested they're they've they've spent most of their life on their back or on their front and so what is it what's the process for a child learning to walk they they pull up 
And sometimes they, you know, they're... You ever seen the kid do this? Look like they just came out of a, you know, 3 a.m. at a bar at a bender. I mean, you know, like that, that's how it is. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to learn how, because their legs, they're, they're developing those muscles. This is why kids typically, they, they learn to pull up first. And then they, they have to put weight on their legs. They use their hands. They use other things to reach out and to stable themselves. They use their parents' hands. And tables and chairs and couches and dogs and walls and anything steady and unmoving to stabilize themselves. To give themselves the opportunity to strengthen their little legs. And when they take their first steps, what do we do? We cheer. Those, those first steps when they like start to come toward mom or dad or the dog or whatever without any assistance... We, we cheer so loud. It's, it's way more meaningful than whoever won the Super Bowl. It's, it's so much more like we, it's, it's, it's like God has designed it where it is implanted into our memory. Like it, that is so meaningful for us. Can you imagine a parent scoffing at their child's First steps. Can you imagine a parent? What a disappointment. You should have got three steps. Why can't you like balance your disproportionately big head <laughs> on top of these little untested legs? What is the matter with you? Right? Like, if that happened as a, as a parent, like, what would you do if you watched that interaction? I know what I would do, and I can't say it, because this is going online. <laughs> How do you think our Heavenly Father responds when we test our legs? When we encounter various trials? When we fall? When we fail? Do you think that he is excited over the steps that you just took? Or do you think he's mad because you fell down? How you answer that question will largely determine whether or not you can count various trials as all joy. It will, it will largely determine how you answer that question, what you think about God and how you think God looks at you as you're taking your first steps, will determine whether or not you count it as joy. If you don't see God as being pleased that you've taken a step, even in the midst of your failure, even in the midst of your falling, then it's going to be very, very discouraging for you. It's going to be very, very hard for you to count those trials as joy. That He's working to produce steadfastness in you. That He's working to make your legs perfect. That He's working to make you you know, not lacking in anything. It, it's going to be how you relate to, to Him. It's not cruel for a parent to expect to help to train their child to walk. And it's not cruel for God to allow trials into the life of His children as we learn to walk with Christ. The good news is, He's a really good older brother. That always has a hand. He, I mean, Jesus himself said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We, he's always there to reach out for stability. And, that, and that's why God sent him. Because he's a good dad. He's given us a good older brother. Who also is our Lord. <laughs> that we can relate to that way. Because he is so perfect toward us in his kindness, in his mercy, in his faithfulness. And the trials that He allows us to go through are not meant to exasperate us. They're not meant to exhaust us. They're not meant to just crush us. But instead to strengthen us. He sent Jesus, His only Son, our older brother, to bring us into His family. Jesus met various kinds of trials. And for the joy set before Him endured the cross 
despised its shame and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus was steadfast. He set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem and he went there. And it was through those trials that God accomplished the redemption, our redemption. And it's through trials, our trials, that God is making us more and more like Jesus. Perfect, lacking nothing. He's making that for us. He's our faithful older brother. His back is stronger. His legs are more sure. His shoulders are always available. So count your trials as joy. God's not against you. He's for you. Even when you don't feel it, reckon them, count them, deem them, consider them as joy. We're going to have communion here in just a moment. I'll explain explain what, what that's for. So we take communion, we come. And when you come and you put weight on those legs and you come to the table, you're acknowledging that your righteousness is not in your own ability. It's not in your ability to pass the test. It's not in your ability to run a marathon in 4.36 hours, 4, 4 hours, 36 seconds. It's not that. It's Jesus is, he, that's really crazy. If somebody ran a marathon in four hours, that's, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's Jesus. It, we're, we're putting our faith and hope in Jesus, in his righteousness. He's accomplished this. That's who our hope is in. That's what communion's for. If you're not a Christian, if you're, if you're here, for, you've been coming for a while or it's your first time and, and you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to, into a conversation. And let's talk about what that looks like to put your faith and trust in Christ and in Christ alone and not in your own ability. Okay? He's for you. He's not against you. You can go a whole lot further with Him than you can go on your own. And then lastly... The invitation is once we're done with communion, we're going to sing. We get to sing to this God that is for us, not against us. To sing to this God that offers us so much wisdom, which Dan is going to talk about next week. He, this God that is so for us, we get to sing to Him. This God that, that we, we can be so solid and assured in Him that we can count it joy even in the midst of our, our trials. And that looks so weird to our family and our friends who are not believers but we can. So we're going to sing. That's, that's the three invitations. If you're not a Christian, let's talk about becoming a Christian. If you are a Christian, remember who Jesus is, what he's done for you. And then let's sing to him. Let me pray for you, and we'll, we'll sing. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you that you are the perfect older brother, that you accomplished for us what we could never, ever accomplish on our own. And yet you give us all of your righteousness. God, would you take and meet with us now as we sing to you. God, would you remind us as we commune with you, as we take that bread, take that juice, and are reminded of your sacrifice, your life that you gave on our behalf to bring us back to the Father. God, may we celebrate that. It's in your good, good name we pray. Amen.